invite you to turn, uh, well, actually not to turn to the scriptures. I want you to just listen to me for a minute because I'm going to read, read some scriptures. I'm so used to saying that. Uh, this Advent season, uh, we plan to look at uh, the Christmas story through the lens of the Trinity. I haven't done that before. Of the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in the Incarnation. And you might uh, see a problem right away because there are three persons in the Trinity and there are four Sundays in Advent. So that presents a problem. But problem is solved because, Lord willing, um, uh, on the Christmas Eve, which is the fourth Sunday of Advent, uh, we'll have uh, uh, my son Graham will preach that uh, sermon and fill in the fourth Sunday. So we're going to take the next three Sundays and look at the, through the lens of the Father today and then the Spirit next week and then the Son uh, so this morning, we'll view the in- incarnation from the perspective of eternity. Uh, it's certainly pro- possible and normal for us to look at it through prophecy of the Old Testament or through the exposition of the epistles or through the narratives of the Gospels. Uh, but this morning, uh, we want to look at the great event before the event, uh, the story behind this Christmas story, the story behind the story, the, or as one person, the inside put it, the inside story, the event in eternity that affected uh, history. And so as uh, we do that, let's have a word of prayer and ask the Lord to help us. Father, we ask that you might help us now, that you might uh, take the words that I will be reading from Scripture throughout the sermon and uh, use those words uh, in a powerful way. Uh, May your words speak to us. May it convince us. May it revive us and renew us. Uh, Even as good uh, music uh, revives the heart, uh, so may your word, uh, a gift from you, uh, revive our minds and our hearts, that we might think like you, that we might realize what you've given us, that we might be ones who uh, hear the melody of grace, Lord. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As a parent, my favorite years were the years of preschool with our kids. Uh, a day would not go by without them saying something memorable uh, or that would just crack us up or would make us wonder and ponder. And particularly the questions that children uh, are tend to ask, uh, questions like, why is the sky blue? Or why is the sea salty? Or why do onions make you cry? Or one I heard this week in, in olden days, was everything in black and white? Uh, it's a question kids might ask. Or, or why do I have uh, two eyes if I only see one thing? Uh, those kinds of questions. Or another one, what uh, did it feel like on your last day of being a child, Daddy? Uh, you know, you just don't know the answers to some of those questions. Um, one of our kids, I won't say who it was, was uh, with another one of our friends, and the friend took them to a market, and uh, we're, we're shopping, standing in line at the check stand, and uh, uh, our child uh, kind of said very loudly there, will I ever see my mommy again? <laughs> and of course, everybody's looking at her, wondering whether they should uh, do the Amber Alert or whatever uh, there. Uh, uh, Kids can say and ask the strangest of questions. They can even ask theological questions. Uh, good theological. Who made God is probably the number one of that. Uh, where's our dog going to go when it dies? Uh, another question, though, that I thought of this week that is really helpful to us at Christmas time and for this sermon. Uh, what was God doing before he made everything? Ever thought about that? What was God doing in eternity? Eternity is a long time. We can't grasp even the concept of eternity. Uh, The church father Augustine uh, was asked this question once. What was God doing before he created the world? And his answer was creating hell for curious souls. (laughs) That's a little harsh, a little harsh. Uh, We wouldn't answer that question today that way. But when we think of God in eternity, we realize how how different we are from God, how God is not like us. God uh, never was not. How do you get your mind around that? That he always was and is and ever will be. God transcends past and present and future. That time is, it, time itself is his very creation. He made it. He didn't live in it, he made it. John Freeman. One of his books says, 
We are ignorant of the past and future, but God sees all times with equal vividness. We are frustrated because time passes too quickly for us to complete our tasks or too slowly that we become bored. But God is never limited in these ways. Day with him is a day of thousand years and vice versa. And he went on to say, he is everywhere in time as he is everywhere in space. God is Lord of time, sovereign over time. Psalm 92 says, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So how could we possibly know the answer to that question? How could we possibly know what God was doing before he created the universe? It's unknowable, you might say, but I ask, is it really? We can know the things that God has revealed to us, even about things we can't fully understand, like eternity. He has revealed something as a, a particular way for us and what he was doing in eternity. Scott Swain had a blog I read this week. And uh, he said, in, on the one hand, there is the pitfall when we ask these kinds of questions of over-interpretation. And he quotes John Owen, uh, the Puritan, we must carefully and avoid all curiosity or vain attempts to be wise above what is written. On the other hand, there's the pitfall of under-interpretation. And again, he quotes Owen and says, we must study with sober diligence to declare and give light unto what is revealed. In other words, we need to receive what is given to us of God and, and not speculate as to what is not. God hasn't revealed everything to us. But we know at least one thing that has happened in eternity. And that's what I want to talk about this morning it's what theologians have called the covenant of redemption, the pactum salutis, if you like a Latin term for it. And you say, what's, what's that all about? Well, it's the covenant that God made in eternity within the Trinity to save a people for himself. It's not a covenant like the other covenants we find in the scripture, a covenant made in history or a covenant made with people. But it's a covenant made for people. Uh, John Fesco has uh, written a book uh, uh, last year on this subject. And he defines the covenant of redemption as the pre-temporal, intra-Trinitarian agreement among the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit to plan and execute the redemption of the elect. That's a theologian's uh, way of saying it. In other words, this covenant is before and behind all the other covenants of the Bible. It's uh, the fountainhead, the source, the, 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 where, where the covenants come from, source of God's covenant of grace. It's been called God's blueprint for salvation. It's the plan of all plans, the story behind the story, the story behind the story of Christmas. And that's why it's relevant for us in Advent. You know, in Reformed theology, in our tradition, uh, we hold to the fact that there are three basic uh, covenants in the scripture. There's the covenant of works that God made with mankind, with Adam, before the fall into sin. Covenant now that has been broken by Adam, and yet everyone in humanity is under it, under its curse. And secondly, there's the covenant of grace that starts with Adam as well, or God made with his elect, with his people, even with his second Adam, after the fall into sin. And then there's the covenant of redemption, the third one, that God made with himself before creation. The question is, does the scripture really teach this? And there's great debate about that. Well, certainly the Bible does not call it the covenant of redemption. You're not going to hear that phrase in the scripture itself, but of course we don't see the phrase Trinity in all of the scriptures either, and yet we know the concept of God being one being and three persons is taught throughout. Also, the Bible does not give us a lot of information in one location. There's not a chapter or a paragraph that we can go to and just read about the covenant of redemption. It's put together through different passages in scripture. So let's look at some of those passages. Certainly God reveals uh, his purpose in 2 Timothy 1.9. Uh, 
Uh, the Lord says, God saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Here, Paul puts this, this purpose of God. Before anything was made, God had this purpose. It wasn't just given us in Christ Jesus. It was given before the beginning of time. Or 2 Thessalonians 2.13. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers, loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you. Or Galatians 1.4. Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Here, the will of the Father is, is primary. The Father wills this purpose to save a people for himself. Or Ephesians 1, 4, for he chose us in Christ, in him, before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. That's why he has called us to be himself. And so our salvation is given and is promised before the beginning of time, in eternity. And this implies that there was a decision of some sort by God to make, to make this happen. Uh, Peter says on the day of Pentecost, this man, Jesus, was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And Peter, in his first epistle, 120, says he was chosen, as Christ was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last days for your sake. And one last one, Re Revelation 13, 8, it speaks of the beast. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been recorded in the book of life belonging to the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. Now, in history, he's not slain and, until he comes and dies on the cross. And yet, Scripture can speak of this slain, this, this cross as happening already because it's been planned it's been purpose. It's been willed by God himself. Or think of the way in which uh, Jesus speaks to the Father, particularly in the Gospel of John. Over and over again, we see this fact that Jesus claims to be sent by the Father, sent by him, which implies a plan before of the sending. In John 7, for instance, verse 28 Jesus was teaching in the temple court and cried out, Yes, you know me and you know where I'm from. I am not here on my own. But he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him because I am from him and he sent me. Or in John's epistle, he says, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Or Galatians 4.4, 4, but when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights as sons. And so this sending all the way through the scripture that the father sends the son, this implies a, a plan, it implies a, a purpose. Jesus, even in John 10, 36, says that, this. He says, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent in the world? Now we think not just sent, but he's been set apart, set apart from eternity to be our Savior. Or in John 10, 18, Jesus says, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father, a command to go and, and lay down his life, a command the father has given him, a command to take the sheep that the father has given him and save him. So this work, this command is fulfilled when Jesus dies on the cross, that's why at the end of John you hear, it is finished, it is finished. The, the plan is completed. The work is now done. He's died for his people. He's come to do the Father's will. John 5, 36, the, the very work the Father has given me to finish and which I am doing testifies that the Father sent me. 
And we go further, that the son is, is, is depicted as the one who is obedient to this command. Jesus in John 4, 34 says, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish this, his work. Or in John 6, 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I lose none of all that he has given me. But raise them up on the last day. The Father gives the Son not just a, a work and a command, but He gives them a people, an actual people given to Him that He might not lose, that might be there on the resurrection day. And therefore, the Father sins and gives the Son this command of redemption. And the Son's part is to receive that plan, to welcome and, and accept that plan, and to do this very work. Father gives the Son a body, we're told. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 10, verse, verse 5, says, Sacrifice, quoting uh, from uh, Psalm 40, Sacrifice and an offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. The Father actually prepares a body for the Son. That's what we call the Incarnation. Later on, quoting for Jesus, New Testament writer, inspired of the Lord, quoting the Old Testament, says, Here I am. It is written about me in your scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. So the Father gives, and even goes further, does, does, gives the Spirit to the Son without measure. John 3, 34. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God to him, God gives the Spirit without limit. The Spirit is given, we'll get into this next week, is given with, with full measure to the Son. So over and over again, we see that the Father gives the Son the church and the work of redemption and the, a body to do the work and, and, and the Spirit to, to, to be empowered for the work and the promise of, of, of reward and, and the spoils. Isaiah 53, read that in that context. The spoils are His. The exaltation and resurrection will be his because the Father has promised this to the Son. He's made an agreement, a commitment to the Son. But you might say, well, is this really a covenant? And this is where the problem comes in a little bit. Think about it. How can God make a covenant with himself? Covenants involve two parties. Covenants uh, are, are two, two groups coming together, two people at least coming together. And God is one party. He is one God. He is one being. And so that's the question. Fesco asked it well in his book. If the triune God shares a common will, how can individual members of the Trinity enter into a covenant which implies agreement between two different wills? It goes on in another place a few pages later. How can the Father and the Son enter into an agreement if they share the same undivided will. And so some have said, you can't call this a covenant of redemption. You call it something else, but you can't call it that. Some have quote to you say, this, this destroys the oneness of God, one person said. This opens the door to uh, tritheism, of, of, of an idea of a council of three gods, a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit, which Mormonism holds to. You can't do this. Karl Barth said, can we really think of the first and second persons of the triune Godhead as two divine subjects and therefore as two legal subjects who can have dealings and enter into obligations with one another? This is mythology for which there is no place in a right understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity. God is one God, the only subject, the only one subject. Even one has gone so far as to say the covenant of redemption is a departure from Trinitarian orthodoxy. I hold to fact, no, that's not true. Is it really? Think about it for a minute. Let's come back to Scripture. Hebrews 7.20 talks about an oath being given by the Father to the Son. In verse 20 it says, and, and it was not without an oath, this new covenant, Others became priests without an oath, but he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, and he quotes Psalm 110 here, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you, that is Christ, are a priest forever. Because of this oath, the writer of Hebrews goes on, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. So because of the oath given, then the New covenant comes into place. It's the source of it. The new covenant comes 
with a, a former oath that God took. The Lord, the Father, in this case, swore to make the Son a priest forever. And we don't read any of that in the New Testament. We don't read a time when the Father swears something to the Son. So it must have happened before, in eternity. Psalm 110, 1 says, the Lord says to my Lord. Uh, Jehovah says to Adonai, sit at my right hand and till I make your enemies a footstool. The father makes a promise to the son. I'm going to make sure that your enemies are gone. I have a plan. In covenants, promises are made. In covenants, oaths are taken. And then the thing that really solidified it for me is when Jesus in Luke 22, 29, when you read it in the NIV or most translations will say, Jesus says to his disciples, I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me. I give you a kingdom as my father gave, I confer it. But actually, if you look in the Greek, the word for confer there is the word for covenant. And so Theodore Beza, who came in the Reformation after Calvin, and uh, he found this out as he was taking and looking at Jerome's Latin translation, and it was uh, translated, I appoint, he was appointed, the kingdom was appointed to me, I appoint one to you, is the way it's translated there. And Basic translates it, I therefore covenant to you just as my father covenanted to me a kingdom. And this is what uh, Basic sort of started getting the ball rolling again for the church to realize that this, this is best put in the sense of a covenant of redemption. Now, certainly, we don't want to view the covenant of redemption as some kind of bartering session between the Father and the Son or some bargaining debate that was going on within the Trinity. Remember, the Trinity is not three different beings. We're not saying there's one being and then there's three beings and somehow they're one. That's not what we're saying. We're saying there's one being. There's only one God. We hold to that. But within that God... There is some type of diversity. There is what we call persons. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're not saying there are three different beings. And we're not saying that there are three different wills of God. There's only one will. Because God is one. So the covenant of redemption is not three wills becoming one will somehow in some debate. But it's three persons of God willing the same thing, your salvation, my salvation. Trinity has one will, but each member of the Trinity participates in this will in different ways. There are no divisions in the Godhead, but there are distinctions. Uh, there's a distinctive roles that the different persons of the Trinity um, play as we see in scripture if there was no variation within God there would, if there's no plurality of, of any sort in God no different actings within God then there would be no persons we wouldn't even talk about a trinity there would be no trinity as Fesco put it in one line very well God has one will in threefold execution one will threefold execution Notice the Father doesn't die on the cross. That's not scriptural. The Father doesn't become a man. The Son becomes a man. Only the Son becomes a man. The Son doesn't ask the Father to humble himself and become a servant. We don't read that in scripture. Only the Father does this. And so, as we summarize this, it means that the Father sins and the Son submits and the Holy Spirit surrounds and supports all in, in covenant with one another. Now you might say, Ron, that's wonderful. You had some fun time reading theology this week. Uh, that, that's, that's great. How does this, why do I need to know this? Why are you telling me? Go lecture at some seminary if you want. Now, what's the practical side to it? There's many things, but I want to point out two this morning. The first one is the covenant of redemption shows us how secure our salvation really is. When the father says to the son, I will send you to save a people for myself. When the father says, I swear to you that you will succeed in doing this. I will raise you up on the third day and all those connected to you, all your people with you. Then it will happen. 
Because God can't be thwarted. God cannot be overturned. When God makes a promise, when God takes an oath, it's going to happen. And that's why the covenant of redemption is so wonderful to us. If we think about it, that in eternity, God knew us, that all God's decrees are, are carried out. Otherwise, he wouldn't be God. How could it possibly be that a God could give an eternal decree, an eternal purpose to save and choose a people, and then that not happen? It's impossible. God keeps all his covenants, and particularly a covenant within himself. The covenant of redemption has and will be carried out. The son will raise up his own, all those who rest in him, who trust him, He'll raise them up on the last day. And so our faith is secure. Our salvation can't be somehow reversed in the end or canceled out. We can't just somehow get to heaven and like we do sometimes on a a computer or something, see something has been canceled or deleted. Oh, we lost it. We lost it. You'll never lose it because it's in the very counsels of God, your salvation. In eternity past, he knew you. He purposed to save you, Christian. All those who trust him. Even if you're just trusting him for the first time today. He knew you and planned this. And so our hope is in the one who has covenanted within himself to save us. God's covenant with himself is to save you, believer. And he will do it. He will do it. I didn't have time this week to, to read, but uh, Samuel uh, Rutherford, who was one of the authors of the Westminster Confession of Faith, uh, has written something on this, and I didn't have time to get to it, but I got to someone who had gotten to it and gave me one short quote. Let me give you two sentences. He says, Oh, what happiness that I am not my own keeper, but that the Father and Son have covenant-wise closed and shaken hands, the one having given and the other received me, a keeping. Isn't that wonderful? I, I, you know, obviously the Father and Son don't literally come and have a big handshake in eternity. But we, we, it helps us understand that. That it's secure. It won't go away. That's the first application. Second one is this, that the covenant of redemption keeps us on the pathway of grace. It keeps us from thinking that we do something to save ourselves. I was reading little pamphlets in the back there on grace by Sean Lucas. And in it, he points out uh, the 1970 folk singer, Judy Collins. I always loved her voice. I don't love her theology, though. <laughs> Listen to what she says. She says, well, we're, we're, when she was known for singing Amazing Grace, if you might recall. We're always, this is a quote from her, we're always in the path of this power, grace, of our own feeling, and his, my own feeling is that the agnostics, atheists, spiritual people, and devoted church growers alike all have the same experience of grace because it is talking about forces unseen which are always around us. This is very new age. It's very much part of our culture, isn't it? Grace is something that everybody just draws upon in just their different ways. But the Bible says that not everybody receives saving grace. And that grace is not some kind of spiritualism uh, that all humanity shares. It's, it's not a force to be drawn upon by anyone any way they want. Or as Lucas put in two couple phrases, it's not a moral uplift. Grace is not a, a general spiritual enlightenment. Grace is the Christmas stories, friends. Grace is the giving of the Father, of a Son. Grace is the son in the manger for us. Grace is the son becoming our mediator and our security and our surety. Grace is the capacity to see what Jesus actually did in living for us and dying for us and rising for us. Grace is seeing Jesus winning and providing your salvation, your your very being for all eternity, doing that for you. Not a lot of it for you, not, not most of it from you, but every bit of it for you. That's grace. 
Grace is seeing Jesus did it all for you and, and gives it all to you. Gee, grace is knowing you can't add anything to what Jesus has done. You know, if you try to add something to what Jesus has done, if you try to do that, you, you ruin it. You ruin grace. Grace disappears when we start to add something to it of our own doing. Anything. Grace, or really salvation, is, is 100% grace. You've heard me say that. I hope you'll remember that when I'm long gone. Grace is 100% pure, not that I want to go anywhere right now, but <laughs> salvation is 100% pure grace with absolutely no additives. No additives. No human additives. Not even your faith. Faith is even grace. You believe because God has given you that. And so the covenant of redemption is not some theological mumbo-jumbo or some kind of distant doctrine of, of the inner workings of the Trinity that we can't figure out, so why try? The covenant of redemption is grace, pure and simple. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's the covenant of redemption. That's what grace is. That God loved you before you even existed. Before anything ever existed. God chose you before you could choose anything at all. That your salvation was, was going to happen before anything ever happened. Before any molecule ever moved in this universe. You were in God's family before you were even in the human family. You can't do anything to save yourself. All you can do is rest in what Christ has done. Martin Lloyd-Jones, one of the great preachers of the 20th century, who gave up being a medical doctor to be a preacher. You don't see that every day. Said, there is thus uh, clearly a sense in which the message of justification by faith alone, which is what we've been talking about here, can be dangerous. And likewise with the message that salvation is entirely of grace. I would say to all preachers, if your preaching of salvation has not been misunderstood in that way, then you had better examine your sermons again. And you had better make sure that you really are preaching the salvation that is offered in the New Testament to the ungodly, to the sinner, to those who are enemies of God. There is this kind of dangerous element about the true presentation of the doctrine of salvation. I hope you have gone away sometimes from hearing my sermons thinking, that can't possibly be true. That's too good to be true. That means I don't have to do anything to be a child of God. I just rest in Christ and in Him alone. Of course, you know the, the footnote to all that, right? There's the, after that, there's obligations. There's things to do. You're able to do them now, but as far as you're standing before God, there's nothing you can do. It's pure grace. Let me test your ability for this. Uh, a great book to read sometime. Not because I agree with every part of it, but Philip Yancey wrote this book called uh, What's So Amazing About Grace. I read, read parts of it every so often. Not because I agree with everything in it. I really don't. But, I, but at some things, when he is right, he is so right on. And he says, grace has about it a scent of scandal. When someone asks the theologian Karl Barth, he comes up again, what he would say to Adolf Hitler, they lived in the same times, if he had the opportunity, he replied, Jesus died for your sins. Would that be the first thing in your mind <laughs> in talking to Hitler if you had the opportunity? Could Hitler be saved in the end by grace? Grace takes us to the limits, doesn't it? God saves us purely by grace. Nancy went on to say, to this day, some of my friends who rebelled among, along with me in my his, uh, college years 
uh, may, refrain, may remain alienated from God because of their deep distrust in the church. Amid all the distractions of the subculture, somehow they miss the ultimate goal, knowing God. The church, he goes on to quote someone, has spent so much time getting us to fear of making mistake that she has made us all like ill-taught piano students. We play our songs, but we never really hear them because our main concern is not to make music, but to avoid some flub which will get us in trouble. I have now heard the strains of grace, and I grieve for my friends who have not. Now that several decades have passed, I look back on my own legalistic upbringing with some amusement. Frankly, I don't think God cares whether I wear a mustache or not, or any more that God cares whether I use a zipper to close my pants or whether, like the Amish, I use buttons. When I attend a, attended a Bible college, I observed people who followed the rules and missed God, and people who broke the rules and missed God. What burdens me, though, is that group of people who still believe that they miss God because they broke all the rules. They never heard the melody of the gospel of grace. Have you heard that melody of grace? Christian, have you heard it lately in your heart? Have you come within earshot of it lately? Well, come in earshot of it. This Advent, this Christmas season, hear it. Like a song that will stick in your head. You know those kinds of songs you just can't get out of your head? That should be the melody of grace in the life of the Christian. A melody that just won't go away. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we ask that you might help us understand how much you love us. How much you have done for us. May we hear the melody of grace and not say, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and think through the tune and never really enjoy the music. May it stick in our hearts, in our minds, this whole week that you have coveted it with yourself to save us. Oh Lord, we pray that you would help us hear that. May someone that's here that's never heard that or heard it and never really heard it today, may they trust you, resting upon you and you alone. Not in themselves, not looking to themselves anymore, but looking to Christ and him alone. Lord, may we all do that. May we rejoice, rejoice in you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.